Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Belfast. On tonight's panel, Robert Buckland, senior backbencher, previously Solicitor General, and until last year, Boris Johnson's Justice Secretary. An MP for Sinn Féin since 2019 and former Lord Mayor of Belfast, John Finucane. Emma Little Pengelly, former advisor to Ian Paisley and an MP for the DUP, currently a member of the Stormont Assembly. Peter Kyle, an MP since 2015, brought onto Labour's front bench by Keir Starmer, now Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and leader of the Alliance Party and Justice Minister at Stormont, Naomi Long. Good evening, welcome to my panel, welcome to our audience here in Belfast and of course welcome to you at home as well. Do join in the conversation in the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll see what you've got to say on tonight's topics. OK, our first question tonight is from Chris McEldowney. Was Richie Sunak silly not to agree to introduce a windfall tax on energy companies sooner? Right, so of course there's been a big announcement today about a windfall tax or a temporary targeted energy profits levy, as it's been called. Uh, Richie Sunak said it would be silly to act now when we don't know exactly what the situation will be in the autumn. That's what he said previously, and of course he has now acted. Peter. Of course he was, and you're all paying the price for it, because five months ago, Labour proposed this plan to Rishi Sunak, and he said no, it would be silly. Every single day since, the cumulative effect on households is £53 million that you shouldn't have been forced to pay. That's the price of their indecision. We have Boris Johnson saying it's not Conservative. We have other Tory MPs saying it's Communist. And as recently as last week, Tory MPs, including Robert, voted against the windfall tax. And today it was delivered. Now, this is Labour putting forward a plan, leading, and the government following. This is a government that is not in control of its own party and it's not in control of our country. We now need them to go further. We need them to cut the VAT on energy. We need them to cut some of the rates on small businesses. We need them to start investing in some of the things that are going to transform our economy and get it going into a strategic way for the future. Bear in mind that if wage growth had continued along the lines it had under the last Labour government, People on average earnings will be earning £11,000 more today than they are. That's because we have a low growth economy, high interest rates and high tax. The economy is not being run We've properly. Had a pandemic they deserve as well. better. You've had a pandemic, we've had challenges, but the fact is that uh, right before the pandemic, public services were on its knees. Four and a half million people waiting for okay. NHS, 46,000 people waiting for their day in court as victims. You know, public services were running to the ground before the pandemic okay. and the economy was run poorly and growth was double under Labour before the pandemic in the years running, onto it, okay. running into it. That's the fundamental challenge we have. Robert, was Rishi Sunak silly not to agree to introduce a windfall tax sooner? No, he wasn't, because what he also said was that he was going to keep reviewing the position. And as we know, events have intervened in a very dramatic way to make a difficult position even worse. We know about the increase in the uh, energy price cap and we see another one coming down the line in October, which has been one of the main drivers for this change. But we also, between January and now, have had the beginning of a war in Ukraine. We've had further lockdowns in China. We've had international uh, impact uh, effects on inflation that have really caused this uh, crisis to get worse and I think in but this response... all happened before last week so why well, did you vote against it last week well, and you're in favour of it well, tonight? Well no because because last week Labour put forward their proposal what we see today is frankly a windfall tax I'm prepared <coughs> to call it that but it is a better and stronger proposal than one <laughs> of the Labour Party. But what well, it is, Peter, because actually this proposal raises five billion in a year. Your proposal only raised two billion. It also contains an important incentive on these companies to invest in the future of energy to make it greener, and they will get a significant tax incentive from doing that. So this proposal, whilst you can call it a windfall tax, actually I don't care what you call it. It's about the effect that it will have. And what it does is help fund a fifty 
15 billion pound package which is real support in terms of real money coming down the line to every family in this country and particularly for those who are most vulnerable and who are going to really feel uh, the uh, the effect of this uh, price spike in the months ahead exactly what uh, we said five months ago before winter but it wasn't Emma. Peter it wasn't what you said you said something different Emma well, I think regardless of what has happened uh, in the past, and we can see there's been um, this squabble about the issue, I think we can all welcome that it has finally happened today. Um, this was something that was in the DUP manifesto six weeks ago. We met with the Chancellor and we emphasised that we felt that this should happen because the reality is these companies weren't doing anything to really earn these profits. This was a result of a, sort of a byproduct of the rising cost of, of energy generally. Um, so therefore it's right that these, these companies shouldn't be able to get these obscene profits at a time where ordinary people are really struggling to pay their bills. But I think the key thing here, regardless of the history of this, is that now that it is happening, that this windfall, the, the money that is collected from this, will be going in the right direction and targeted at the people who need it most. We know as we come into the autumn, uh, these bills are going to go up, many bills are going to go up, but you know we don't want our pensioners, those who are worst off, having to choose whether they want to hate or eat. You know, that is just not acceptable in the United Kingdom in 2022. Uh, so look, we need to all work collectively and make sure that these monies that are raised uh, from this uh, measure uh, announced today are going in the right direction. The woman at the very back in the glasses. I think, in, in my opinion, it's typical Conservatives. They have knew what was coming with the Sue Gray report, and this is just something to deflect. They have to have something better to deflect from party gate and the disgrace that they are as a government. Okay. The, the, the woman over there in the green with your hand up, yes. Here? Uh, well, I'll come to you in a minute, actually. I was going to the woman in the green dress and then I'll come to you. I was wondering how Northern Ireland will get the money with no executive in place. Right, we'll come on to that in a minute. And the woman in the glass. That was my exact question. You're going to ask the same. <laughs> yes. Okay, so what we have at the moment is, yeah. is the money is coming to Northern Ireland, but there's one aspect of it, the energy bill support payment, which has been doubled from 200 to 400 pounds. At the moment, there are discussions about how that is going to get paid to Northern Ireland because it will not automatically come because the Assembly uh, is not sitting. John. Well, I think in answer to the original question, um, there should have been a windfall tax much sooner than today. It's a very belated recognition of what people have been feeling in their pocket and in their homes um, for a very, very long time. We have called for a windfall tax. Um, I think any mitigations that will help uh, as announced today are low-income families, um, pensioners, those in receipt of disability benefits is to be welcomed. But it's already been touched on from the comments the reaction from our caretaker finance minister today to the Treasury's announcement is to immediately engage with them to figure out how that money can get into the pockets of people here who need it. Because the reason why it can't automatically go into the pockets is because we have no executive. And I actually was very surprised to hear Emma speak about how important cost of living is. Because if it was that important, we would have an executive, we'd have ministers round the table, and money would be released and going into people's pockets. Okay. Take the man here in the white shirt. Um, little Pangali made the comment that um, the companies that are making the money because of the rise in price, what does the panel think with the green energy? Is it going to be windfall tax? Because they're making money as well because of the rise in price. Okay. The man behind you in the dark blue. I was going to, uh, excuse me, uh, reflect on the other person's comments about the timing of it. It's <clears throat> throughout the pandemic, this government's acted too late. And they've really only acted now, which again is too <coughs> late, because of what was announced yesterday with the windfall, with, with the, the Sue Gray report. It is nothing to do, if, if the Sue Gray report hadn't come out, we wouldn't be getting this windfall tax. That's it. They voted against it last week. It's a seven days. I know it's a long time in politics, but we've all got short, long memories. Maybe I'm going to come to you in a minute. Robert, do you just want to answer that question? There's two people have yeah, it now. Look, look, I, I think... Specifically about time. I, I think if we hadn't announced it today, Parliament goes into recess for another 10 days, we wouldn't have had an announcement until the 6th of June. Frankly, I just want the government to get yeah. Yeah. on last with it. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, you're entitled to have a, a cynical view of it. Week, I don't enough. particularly have a cynical view. I think the, re the reality is that we saw some of the debate going on about the merits of a windfall tax. There clearly was an issue about whether or not it would be right to single out this 
particular industry uh, and frankly the mechanism the precise mechanism that we now have took a bit of time to uh, sort out but we've had the announcement and, and I think it's most welcome. No. Well, I try hard not to be cynical um, about these things, but I think that uh, you know a blind man on a galloping horse would see this for what it is. And essentially what we have here is the government wanting to deflect from a bad news day yesterday and coming forward with a package of measures um, today that will hopefully um, get them some good publicity. And to be fair, I actually welcome the package of measures that have been brought forward. I think it's too little, too late in some, in some instances. So you don't think but it goes I do far think enough? It's important. I don't think it goes far enough. And I I think the reason that I say that is because I think that if you compare, for example, what has been done today in terms of the profits that have been made, it is a relatively light touch when full tax in comparison to some of the extortionate profits that have been made during this period. And bear in mind also... It's 25 per cent. It isn't only the energy companies that have benefited from that windfall. The Treasury has benefited too from all the VAT on the rising costs of fuel. The so Treasury has benefited from the pain of people. So it's right that that should be redistributed and I'm glad that it has happened. But I think for Robert to try and convince us here this evening um, that it had absolutely nothing to do with the Sue Gray report uh, and the outcome of it yesterday, I, I think really stretches credulity to its limits. You're okay. on the corner there in the, in the white top. Yes. Yes, you. Um, my parents are actually uh, disabled. Uh, my dad is sick. Um, and we're all on low incomes. And as far as I know, Northern Ireland isn't protected by the energy price caps. Um, no, it's, it's a different system here. Yeah, so we're frankly terrified of how we're going to be able to afford our bills. So how is it affecting you day to day? Uh, I'm ill myself, I'm on universal credit, and I have to choose whether I put my heating on, whether I have dinner. So that's what you're doing at the moment? Yeah. You, you're skipping meals as a result? Mm -hmm. That's a Shame on the Tories. Shame on the Shame on the Tories. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, the man here in the blue shirt. Whether, whether it's to cover Boris Johnson or not, and whether the executive are sitting or not, when the money comes across, John, you sat outside um, Stormont for three years, so you <coughs> can't say anything about the DUP. Get the money to the people that need it. OK. And the man in the stripy shirt at the very back. It's, it's, just, it's just Johnson's government trying to buy forgiveness from the population, that's all it is. It's trying to buy forgiveness for the rotten things that you've done while you've been it there. All the sleaze, the scandal. What, the 400 that, that million, can, the 400 that million we spent on COVID? 200 grand on what bloody wallpaper? No, what about all the jobs that the government saved well, during COVID? Uh, what about the 400 uh, billion that was spent by the government to save jobs and to save the economy? What about the interventions that this chance that and this government made? You don't have to claim universal credit as well. What this government has no. actually done to help people and to but, sit right. there and to say that we don't care just, I'm afraid to use Naomi's you point, voted, stretches credulity to, to breaking you point. You voted now to feed hungry children, that is disgusting. Disgusting. But, but Talking also, about free school also, meals. Robert, there was yeah. also £11.8 billion worth of fraud because of lax yeah. standards in Treasury. Why don't you, rather than writing that off, try and recover some of that money well, look, and use some of that money to start helping people in need? Peter, and the other I thing you do is actually cut VAT on energy straight away, and that would help people instantly. You know, these are the things you could do straight away, rather than having overcomplicated, costly schemes that it takes you five months to drag it out of government. In fact, their, and, and sch their sorry, scheme is more generous no, than what you were no, suggesting. No, no, no. Yeah. we suggested it five months ago, and if we'd done it, actually would have got us to this yeah. point. So, th actually, but the point is, they could have acted in time, but rather, rather than accusing the audience of being cynical, it is absolutely extraordinary that you don't see the cynicism in today's announcements, straight after a day when Boris Johnson was dragged to his knees because of his squalid behaviour throughout the pandemic. Don't ask for credit for Boris Johnson through the, through the pandemic when we now know what he was doing. The culture. There were people okay, throwing we, wine well, up the walls. We they may, were sick we may and come vomit that, in number sure 10 Downing Street. To... Peter, you know, all, all I'm seeking on. to do is to try and get some balance here. And you ignore the point that the government had already announced £22 billion pounds of, it, of it in, intervention into the economy to help And most of that was for national insurance the no, well, that's compensation. The fight, most of that was to compensate for the so tax Thousands rises. of people are going to benefit from a national insurance tax cut in July. This which wasn't something that was just thought out of the air. 
there, this is another stage on direct interventions that the Chancellor has once again made. Like I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To I, refer to the COVID crisis because the government did what it took. You cannot get away with saying that the national insurance is a tax cut because you are reducing what you put up six months ago. You're reducing what well, you've it, already put up, and, and it, then also oh, yes. most of okay. the money, most of the money released tax, today what I need to, stop. to compensate. Hang on. <laughs> what I need to stop is this being a debate okay. solely between you two, because we have an audience here and other people on the panel. <laughs> so let's hear one more contribution from the audience. The man at the back. 2000, yes, sorry. 2010 to 2014, the price of crude oil is about the same price it is now. 2010 to 2014, we were paying about 130 a litre. It's now, as you're driving tonight, it's 170, 180. How can you let that happen, which affects everybody? And if it's affecting that, what else is it doing to other industries? You're allowed to put your prices up by 25% and make obscene profits. There is something fundamentally wrong by you not intervening and doing something about that. OK. Robert, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Before I do, I'm just going to tell you where we're going to be next week. Oh, no, next week we're taking a break, of course, because it is the Queen's Jubilee. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, but after that, the programme is going to be in Dorking on the 9th of June, and the week after that we're in Newcastle. So if you are in or around Dorking or Newcastle and you want to become a big part of the audience, we'd love to see you apply on the BBC website. Uh, you'll follow the question time link there and you can come and be part of our audience. Right, let's take a second question now, which is from Rowan. Rowan Wise, where are you? There you are. The protocol undermines our cherished position of equal citizenship in the United Kingdom. Do you agree? So the Northern Ireland protocol you're referring to there, Rowan, uh, what do you think? I absolutely believe that it does. And, uh, as long and why as do you think that? As long as that one of the basic principles of sovereignty of any state is free trade between the constituent uh, polity of that state and the main British mainland and Northern Ireland, we're one and the same, and there needs to be no trade borders within the United Kingdom. That's an absolute red line, and Stormont should not be operating until, unless and until, not words, but action happens. Cheers and booze in equal measure, I'm hearing from our audience here. Emma. Well, look, I know people are in very different places in relation to this issue, but I absolutely agree with you. For me, as a unionist, it fundamentally fractures the United Kingdom. I don't believe that is good for Northern Ireland. I don't believe that is good for the United Kingdom, quite and frankly. I just want to explain to, to, to people who aren't here in the audience, who perhaps are not quite so familiar, the fact that you're, you're refusing to take part in the Assembly because you want the Northern Ireland Protocol to be completely changed. Yeah, so that's a key um, ask of the Democratic Unionist Party. We've listened to people across Northern Ireland, unionists who feel very strongly on this issue, and we need to get this addressed. We have been talking about this issue for um, over two years and it has been ignored by the European Union, it's been ignored by London, it's been ignored by Brussels. And unfortunately, look, it grieves me that we are in this situation now, but we're only in this situation because there hasn't been solutions put forward, there hasn't been that agreement to the changes that need to happen. It's not just about the United Kingdom and the Union, it's also real issues that will impact on everybody. We need to remember about 90% of the protocol isn't even in place yet. About 90% I mean, of the, the protocol, of that should there's be grace periods, there's been suspensions of that. Now, when you look at what this means, if there was to be full implementation, you can look at the EU report from June of 2021, and that sets it out. Personal luggage would be checked, huge amounts of goods would not be able to come here without uh, huge swathes of paperwork and cost. That cost is going to be passed on to the consumer in a cost of living crisis. Now, people say get back in to Stormont now and sort out cost of living, but this is something that is going to happen. It is going to hit like a tsunami in the autumn if we don't get this addressed. It is really serious, and that is why, sadly, the DUP have taken this position now because we have been dismissed demeaned, disregarded, as have the views of huge swathes of unionism across Northern Ireland. We need to get this address. All parties have recognised there are some problems with the protocol. Um, it is clear that there's already problems. 500 million a year is being spent on paperwork by the Trader Support Service already. So these costs are just going to grow. Consumer co um, choice is going to be limited. The medicines issue still isn't even sorted out. Two years of talking. Enough is enough. We need to get this resolved now. 
Robert, this is, of course, the Northern Ireland Protocol agreed by the Conservative government. Yes. Yes, and, and I think uh, that Emma's evidenced already some of the considerable tensions that exist. And I think it would be irresponsible of the British government to ignore that, to sit on its hands and just say, well, tough, we're, we're going to have to just wait and see. Because what has happened here is that the mechanisms by which, which were set up in order to negotiate how the protocol could work are just not coming together and that's uh, I, I think i don't want to play blame game tonight i don't think it's right to do that but the simple fact well, is you don't that, think it's the government's fault well no because we are the, the government consistently tries to negotiate but uh, our counterparts in Europe won't change the, the basis upon which they want to negotiate. That's a matter for them. But that does lead to a problem, it leads to an impasse here. And there is evidence that this is leading to a problem and it's leading to a direct challenge to uh, east-west trade and to the sort of dislocation that I don't, I don't think was in anybody's minds when this uh, agreement was reached. And therefore, it's the duty of the British government, I think, and, and it did last week, to signal that it would be prepared to take action uh, to let legislate at Westminster in order to deal with this problem. Now, I think that that should be a last resort. I still believe in the power of negotiation. But I'll say this. I think there's another agreement here that is more important, and that's the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And that, in my mind, takes precedence over the protocol. And therefore, the protocol should be interpreted without any prejudice to the vitally important process that started here with the consent of the people of Northern Ireland and the Republic in 1998, uh, and which any British government has to work night and day to uphold and maintain. And that's why I think it is right for the government to signal that it is prepared to take action on the protocol. Okay. Listen, I just want to come to a member of our audience, uh, Katie Hayward. You're, you're sitting there. You're a professor of political sociology at Queen's University here in Belfast. Unusually, we've asked you to come and be part of our audience. I suspect, like many of the people at home, unlike our panel, I'm sure, you have read every word of this protocol. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you can all recite it verbatim. Um, what's your assessment? In terms, of, in terms of what Robert's saying here, and, and to a certain extent, Emma, is what we're seeing now in Northern Ireland something that we could have expected, given the way the protocol is worded, or is it actually being interpreted in a different way? Well, it was quite clear um, what the protocol meant, in that it did mean checks and controls down the Irish Sea in order to avoid those on the land border. That's absolutely clear. And as Emma mentioned, we do have the Trader Support Service and other functions supported by the government to facilitate that movement across the Irish Sea. Um, however, we need to put it in context. Um, it, we aren't facing a tsunami, um, as Emma puts it. Um, there are grace periods existing at the moment with the agreement of the UK and the EU, and that was deliberately, first and foremost, they were there to enable people to adapt to these new arrangements. I think, what Emma, you were saying that there, there, you, there will be a tsunami if all the checks come in. I think that's what if, you were if, saying. Yes, so if we come to an end of the grace period with no agreement, then certainly, um, if they were fully enforced, there would be significant disruption. And is um, this what, what, what we should have expected all along, or not? Well, um, in terms of... Uh, well, we should, should certainly have expected adjustment to trade, and I think big part of the problem in January 21 was that there wasn't proper preparation. What we have seen since then, all the surveys show, is that we have had adaptation. And so over two-thirds of businesses now, according to the Northern Ireland Chamber quarterly survey, ha say that they have adapted well to the new post-Brexit and post-protocol arrangements, and only 8% of businesses say they're finding significant challenges. And this is why businesses are saying, we do need the UK and EU to talk. Any unilateral action is suboptimal. We need a negotiated outcome um, in order for the certainty the businesses have been asking for for such a long time. John. Does the protocol undermine the cherished position of equal citizenship, citizenship in the United Kingdom? No, I, I, I don't agree with the premise that the protocol is an identity issue. Uh, I think it's a trading issue. Um, it, it's worth repeating the fact that the protocol was as a result of a very painfully long set of negotiations since the Brexit referendum, which I'll remind people if they need reminding, people here didn't vote for. Um, but when those who championed for Brexit, like the DUP did, and for those who rejected every manifestation of Brexit the way the DUP did. I think it's a bit rich to then complain about the outworkings of a political movement that you back from the very outset. The protocol, the protocol is not something that was imposed by the European Union upon the United Kingdom. It was an agreement that was negotiated. It was an agreement that was then entered, entered into by the, two, uh, by the two partners. 
It was legislated for. In fact, Boris Johnson won a, a, an election solely on getting Brexit done. And in fact, if we cast our minds back to 2020, we were told that customs checks in the REC wouldn't alter the constitutional basis of this jurisdiction one bit. That's not my words. They're the words of Geoffrey Donaldson. We were also told that this had enormous economic potential. Again, the words of DUP representatives at that time. And that is the truth. This allows a small jurisdiction unique access to two markets. When I'm in Westminster, I talk to Scottish colleagues who say quite literally they would give their right arm for the economic position that we find ourselves in. Now, are there, are there problems with such a fundamental trading shift? Of course there are. Is there ability to solve those? You better believe it. And contained within the protocol are the mechanisms to identify problems and then find and implement solutions. But you will only do that if you have two people willing to negotiate with each other in a credible fashion. And frankly, the British government have been found wanting in that regard. Okay. Man there in the black T-shirt. The DUP, no, 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 no. Theresa May had a better deal. So... With the backstop? With the backstop, like... So, what do they want? They don't come up with solutions. They just come up with no, no, no. Maybe it's time they get back into their jobs, they get the paid for. She's not even elected. And I will come back to you. Yes, the man here. I am a unionist and I find myself agreeing with John and challenging Emma because the, two days ago the head of the CBI said that this, get, the, the protocol gave Northern Ireland manufacturers a competitive advantage. He said that lots of businesses in Northern Ireland were finding it a big, a big bonus. Both he and the president of the um, Chamber of Commerce in Northern Ireland have said that the lack of an assembly, the lack of an executive is hurting business and it urgently needs addressed. You're the guys who are dragging down the assembly. Why? Okay. I will come back to you, Emma. There's a lot of questions directed at you. Naomi. I think it's clear when you listen to business that the biggest impediment facing business at the moment is political instability. And that has always been the case. And the government at times play fast and loose with our political stability here. I mean, I listened carefully to Robert saying the importance of consent. Where was consent in Northern Ireland for Brexit? Where was the concern about the impact on the Good Friday Agreement? when the majority of people in Northern Ireland did not consent to that change. Instead, the government not only ploughed ahead with Brexit, but ploughed ahead with the hardest form of Brexit. And the protocol was designed, not something that I supported, but was designed by his own government as a soft landing zone for Brexit, in order that Northern Ireland would be as insulated from the difficulties that Brexit was going to create in terms of trade friction. It also presents us with opportunities, but the only way we can actually e exploit those opportunities to balance the negatives is if we get back into government and start working together to deliver for people. What businesses need is an agreed solution. They need an agreed way forward. We are pragmatic around the protocol. If there are ways that the protocol can be diminished in terms of its impact, then let's grasp that with both hands. But what we can't do is throw the protocol out because without the protocol, the entire trade and cooperation agreement between the EU and the UK is put in jeopardy. And that will have major impacts for everyone in terms of creating potential trade war and inflationary pressures. Now, we need to think long and hard about whether we want to layer upon layer the challenges that people are facing or whether as politicians we should be sitting down rationally looking for yeah. solutions to make life easier for the people we represent. Oh, okay. I will yeah. The man in the red t-shirt. The man in the red t-shirt there. As a unionist I agree with what most of what Emma has said but I don't think any right of storm is going to do anything. We've seen this week we can't trust Boris to act and talking to the EU has been like talking to a brick wall. They're not going to budge. Okay. And the man towards the back in the white shirt. I just would like to say, um, I noticed there Naomi Long was saying about the protocol and about um, the issues with it. It wasn't so long ago that she was calling for the rigorous implementation. And another point just to make is, I mean, everybody's quick to point to the DUP for bringing down Stormont. Was it not another party that brought Stormont down not so long ago? And uh, Michelle O'Neill was the health minister at the time. There wasn't much concern for the health of the people of Northern Ireland then. Right, so you're talking about insane. 
If I could come back on that specific Briefly, because I need to bring Emma back. And I will come back briefly. The issue around rigorous implementation was in specific response to the fact that Robert Buckland's government was standing up, the Secretary of State saying they were going to break the law in specific and limited ways. Now, if you think it's OK for government to break the law, then you can't really complain about the farce that we've seen over the last 48 hours with the government that thinks it's above the law and can do what it wishes. There was no it's condition, there was no the condition on met, rigorous implementation. And the law okay. is respected. Let me bring Peter in, because you've not yet answered the main question. Okay. The protocol undermines yeah. our cherished position of equal citizenship in the United Kingdom, which is something, Rowan, that you clearly feel very strongly. Well, I'm in the strange position as Labour is, because we voted against the protocol. Uh, Robert says that people you know, couldn't have understood how it would be implemented. Actually, we did. We read it before we voted for it, and we saw what the implications were going to be, so we didn't want it to go ahead in that way. But something crucial changed. It was signed into law, international law. So really, now the circumstances have changed because of that. We know that, the, that Boris Johnson doesn't have a personal regard for the law. We know that the government breaks the law, both domestic and international. But we do. So the only credible way forward is now to negotiate and establish functional negotiations with the EU so we can move forward. The only way to smooth the challenges we have with the protocol is to work with the EU so the EU changes its law. We can't negotiate, open up negotiations because you need your partner to agree to doing that. But the, what they have agreed to do is to look at ways that they can change European law to take certain issues out of the protocol altogether. Now, that's on the table. The, the UK government says it wants to do many of these things. Uh, the DUP and all the parties at Stormont say that they want to do these things. So these are negotiations that are failing because everybody agrees they want progress. It's absurd. The way forward is going to be statecraft, diligence and graft. All of the things that Boris Johnson and his government have shown they cannot deliver. On the thing about consent, if I might, but... Briefly. On the thing about consent, it is an issue because of power sharing for legislation within Northern Ireland. Consent doesn't apply to Westminster. Three times in her statement, Liz Truss said that she needs to pull out of the protocol because it now has, has, doesn't have consent within Northern Ireland. Well, the DUP, to their credit, did vote against the protocol in Westminster, so it didn't have consent at the outset. So nobody was listening to them then. This week in Parliament, just two days ago, the government introduced legacy uh, legislation which will grant amnesty to terrorists from the Troubles. Every single political party in Stormont from both communities have voted against it and stood up against it and the government's going ahead. Where is consent then? They are playing fast and loose with the Good Friday Agreement. They pick it up when it suits them. They put it down when it suits them. And today, Brandon Lewis is in Belfast. Where is he? He's not here to speak to you. Emma, let's come back to what there was a, a, a member of the audience here was saying actually what's not helping business is, is the DUP not being at Stormont and not having a functioning executive rather than the Northern Ireland Protocol. And as I outlined, like the DUP has taken this step after many years of trying to talk, trying to negotiate and trying to get this changed. Look, like Sinn Féin brought the Northern Ireland Assembly down and kept it down for three years on a matter that was important to Sinn Féin. Now, I understand that the protocol and Northern Ireland's place in the Union is not important to Sinn Féin, but it is important to Unionists. But the Unionist concerns have constantly been dismissed and demeaned by all of the other parties. We are told constantly that we don't actually feel the way that we feel, that Unionists aren't really worried about this. You know, Naomi Long's party did put out without condition um, asking for rigorous implementation. Now, people are saying, I, oh, we read the document, we knew what was coming down the tracks. Can Naomi Long really say to the people here today that she knew that somebody with a guide dog would not be able to bring that dog from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, that we would not be able to get access to medicines from our biggest medicines market of Great Britain, that you know, sausages and chilled goods would be stopped coming over the border, despite the fact that these, despite this, like, is, this is the result protocol, of Brexit, but, but this is a result of the protocol, and that's no, the reality, the and we have to Brexit. be honest about that. It's the result of Brexit, and unlike your and, party, and, and, Unlike your party, we didn't deliver Brexit. We didn't deliver and with the greatest respect, Brexit. Naomi, we have you've done spoken, what and, we and have I'm trying done. to respond to what we have done. Wait a minute. Okay. Briefly, a bit because, more from you, Emma, then I need to bring you. Hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can speak now. Okay. Naomi, I'm sorry, we've heard from you twice. Forgive me. John, briefly from you. And then let's hear from you. Look, we can keep going back to Brexit and having the squabbles that everybody's been having for years or years, or we can get around the table and try to find solutions because medicines issues, 
pets, plants, business. No, no. This has to be resolved because uh, because for this reason, no, for this reason. Hang on, okay? wait one minute. Just in case we people came can't back hear, in. Just, yeah. moment, just in case people can't hear, what the general shouting is is you need to get back into your job and do do your and, and take your place at the Stormont Assembly. And the reason why not is because whenever the DUP were in government and we kept that going for two years, the, the issues and concerns were entirely dismissed. They were dismissed. Okay. We are still waiting on resolution from the European Union on medicines, life-saving okay, medicines for the point. people of Northern Ireland. John, please yeah, continue. We're not going to move on. Has to end. Um, we need to get solutions. I've, I've two. Don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. I have two. Okay. I have two. I have two quick points. It's, it's been referenced. Hang on. In, uh, Tell you what, John. Let's just. Sorry, you're saying don't go back. Don't go back. Because lots of people are saying that the, the, the DP should well, get they're, back they're, in. No, don't clearly, back. clearly, clearly, don't, don't have the same political view as I do. When John, when John Finucane tells me that my place within the United Kingdom is safe, I'll go home happy tonight. Not. No when, when he did, he did. Sorry, this is the question. Well, the courts, courts have ruled differently. Right, Go on. Sec Make sec it secondly, when, when David oh. Trimble... Read the Hang on, let's hear from our... Second, that's why they're here, and we want secondly, to hear your voice. when David Trimble, the co-author of the Belfast Agreement, says, tear up the protocol to save the agreement, I tend to listen to David, even though I politically don't agree with him all the time. So that... No, sorry, sorry. We're talking about the question, which is about our position within the United Kingdom. That's why the DUP and all the other unionists have a problem with the protocol, not about Brexit, about our position within the United Kingdom. And you Kingdom. feel it threatens your position in the United Kingdom? Yes. yes. OK. Do you, would you like to answer Yeah, the, yeah but look, That's there's a very specific. Yes, I, and I will, but there's a couple of points, and I, I am going to answer your question. In, in reference to the Assembly's collapse previously, it was as a result of financial scandal, which was squarely at the door of the DUP. And within a year... Which, which within could a year, and, and should have been worked through. Emma, Emma, Irish Language Act, Irish Language Act. If I can finish the point, Emma, within one year of that, we had an agreement with the DUP to go back in, and they walked away from that. Now, two points. No, no, Sometimes you said you're going to make two years. Yes, I know, and I'm going to answer. I'm going, more, yes, and, then to that and to be fair, there. I had an additional question put to me. Sometimes we speculate as to what the people think. Well, two or three weeks ago, we found out the vast majority of people who cast their vote at the ballot box return parties that support and recognise the protocol as being necessary to protect us from the worst impacts of Brexit. In answer to your question, the only thing that is going to change the constitutional basis on this island is when there is a referendum, as, as legislated for in the Good Friday Agreement. Our Court of Appeal, our High Court, and soon to be the John, Supreme Court. Wait a minute. How do you cuts? persuade this man who feels, he, who feels that his position is threatened by the by the I'm, I, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to patronise him by persuading him. He has his view, and it's not a case of me not listening. Well, I, not, res I respectfully... Just, it's not just this me. I respectfully, the Irish 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 respectfully Irish disagree. Sorry, it's every other unionist that has a problem with the protocol. But not all unionists would say that everybody else needs to be held to ransom, that we have no executive. No, no, that's, the Ulster that's, Unionist that's, Party would win. Sorry, sorry, so when sorry, we hear when stories like we've heard tonight about cost of living, when we look at our health service, I don't agree with anybody that says... Everybody else can just suffer because we have right. a problem with an agreement that the British government and the European Union entered into willfully. Wait a minute, I want to hear a bit more from you. Thank you, sir, for your contributions. Yes, the man here at the front. If Liz Truss takes the legislation through, or there's a negotiation between the EU and the UK, and you get the, the, the assurances you need for the customs and the moving of goods. Will you go back into the executive? That's a yes or no question. What's your answer? The DUP is a party of devolution. We want the Northern Ireland so Assembly yes to work. No? So yes, we have to look yes. at the proposals no. coming forward. No. And if they meet the seven tests that the DUP have set out, then yes, then there is okay. a pathway to restoration. But we need to be sure that this is going to happen. Okay. And the protocol the woman, is going to be addressed. The woman here. Um, I was just going to go back to the comment that keeps being made about Sinn Féin collapse the executive before, and that's obviously wasn't great either, but that's the thing that really makes me so fed up about politics here. It's all about what about her, they did it first, Stebbins, yeah, whereas we yeah. just need to get on and do stuff. Like, that's not what affects the health service, it's not going to get people jobs, houses, and it's just really depressing. Like, like, no, like, no like, in fact, you're, none of you are going to say anything, because I'm going to move on. <laughs> but thank you very much for, for your point. Right, because otherwise we won't talk about anything else on this programme, and lots of you asked about other things, so it is my duty to try and get through those questions. OK, let's have one from Sinead Tumulty. Where are you, Sinead? I'm right here. Great. <laughs> um, so, uh, hello. Following the publication of the Sue Gray report, which is more important, 
being able to say goodbye to work colleagues or loved ones as they die? Robert. Being able to say goodbye to loved ones as they die is clearly far more important and all of my friends and people in this audience and outside who went through that experience will feel it very personally when they see people who uh, make the laws break those laws. It's plain and simple. And but Boris Johnson said he felt it was his duty to say farewell to colleagues, which I think is at the heart of, of your question. So tell me if I've got that wrong. He felt it was his duty to say goodbye to work colleagues, whereas other people were not allowed well, to say goodbye to their nearest and, and dearest. And I think the answer to that is that there is a time and a place, and that wasn't it. Because we were living under restrictions, all of us in varying degrees in different parts of the country, different times of the crisis, but the restrictions were very clear and they changed our lives. And so was there Boris is Johnson no, right to say that it was his um, duty to uh, say farewell I, to colleagues? I think that he clearly, uh, uh, he and the, the team, and number, well I'm trying to, he and the team in number 10 clearly got it wrong and I've so he was the, wrong to from say day one to I've said that what happened colleagues. was wrong and I think that what should have happened was that they should have said well now is not the time if all is well in a year's time however long it takes then perhaps after uh, the end of the pandemic when the restrictions are gone we can do it then that's what so many other millions of people have done with their lives they postponed weddings all sorts of events commemorative events so just, uh, so just to be uh, so clear all so the prime minister this. was wrong when he oh, look, said I he think, felt it was his look, duty I, to say farewell I to think, colleagues at I the think, time i think i think it was wrong and, and I, I think that uh, we have seen that report, which was pretty damning. Uh, it was, uh, she didn't pull her punches at all, as I thought she wouldn't. Uh, she's a very independent-minded person, of course, well-known uh, in Northern Ireland as well, with her connections here. And she produced a very thorough and hard-hitting report. The question for me, frankly, is what are the consequences of that? And I know a lot of people are saying, well, come on, Robert, you've got to make up your mind. Should you call for Boris Johnson to resign? I've given it a lot of anxious thought. I asked yes. him a direct question on Wednesday. I asked him whether he deliberately lied to the Commons. He denied that he deliberately lied to the Commons. <laughs> well, I, I, do you he's believe given him? me a direct answer and I accept that answer. Uh, what I would be interested to see is what happens with, with the Privileges Committee, of course, who are going to look at that very issue. But um, he has been asked a direct question by me. He gave me that And did you answer. believe the answer? And I, as I said, I accept that answer. Do you, do, am I happy about the situation? No, you Can I just point out the obvious? Can I just but point at the same out Robert, time, I think... Let him finish. Well, him. hold on, Peter. I think at the, I was in government at this time, and I can tell you I had not a Scooby-Doo and knowledge, any knowledge about what was going on. Uh, and when I heard about it, well, along with the rest of the country, because I was out of government by then, I was as shocked and appalled okay. as everybody have else. You your letter yet? You're being asked, have you submitted a letter? I don't do letters. If I think a that somebody no has, uh, should resign, I would say publicly. I don't, I don't do skullduggery and plotting. Robert, if I could just quickly point out the obvious. You're, you're, you've come to Belfast, the place that Boris Johnson came and said, over my dead body will there be a border down the Irish Sea, and then went and legislated for it. And you said that you believe every word he says. Well, I didn't say that, did I? I asked him a direct question. He gave oh, you don't? Yes. Direct he gave a direct, no, he no, gave a direct answer to the people uh, of Northern Ireland. Hang on, hang on. Let, 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 let Robert <laughs> Look, I worked in government with him for the thick end of two and a half years. There's a lot of things that we did together which worked very, very well indeed and I'm not going to list them now but they are the clear and for people to judge and therefore I do uh, 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 having worked with somebody uh, when I ask them a direct question I expect an honest and direct answer and I had that on Wednesday okay. and the privilege, privilege committee will look at that direct issue John yeah. yes and the electorate as well John I, I, I think that um, this is a man who is devoid of trust, no matter what side of the political spectrum you come from. Um, he... But I, I think the reality as well is, depressingly, who is really surprised? You know, this is a man who, who makes and breaks agreements. He acts in partisan and uh, unilateral fashion. And I think the only positive thing that I can think to say is that he doesn't have a mandate here. Um, he has no representatives here. Um, he is not certainly not popular. And as I said, it's, um, it was disgraceful behaviour. And I think he has shattered and lost any ounce of trust that he has from the public, certainly people here. 
Yeah. The man in the blue jacket. Yeah, I think we can see um, how the Conservative government make their decisions. It's kind of like the amnesty that we talked about. As long as you believe you're telling the truth, well, then you're telling the truth. OK, the woman behind you... I'm just trying to work that out. The woman behind you in the glasses. I would just like to say, from a personal perspective, I find Boris Johnson's behaviour an absolute disgrace. From a professional perspective, I'm a frontline nurse, have worked all through the pandemic, as have many of my colleagues. I personally did not see my family for three months. I sat on Christmas Day on my own. It actually makes me quite emotive to think about it. I'm sure. So, hang on, just tell us about that then. So, you, why did you not see your family for three months? Because my mum is a vulnerable adult and I had to protect her. So, I had to stay away from my family. I was working frontline in COVID and, you know, I, I feel listening to the panel tonight, I thought that this was going to be such a good and positive outcome to a lot of things. But, I find that we go back to the same tittle-tattle again. And I think the bottom line here, the, the take-home message that I'm personally asking people to take home with them is in a healthcare situation, it doesn't matter what side of the political divide you come from, everybody is equal. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think we all agree that the most important thing is the pain of the families who didn't spend those last few minutes with their loved one who was dying, who weren't able to hold their hand and be there when it mattered. And we all have had that experience at some point in our lives and it's never easy. It's difficult for those families who weren't able to have contact with their family because they were working on the front line and trying to protect them. But what it has exposed, I think, is the deep-seated culture of entitlement at the very heart of this government. And that is down to Boris's own leadership and approach. It's as though the rest of the rules that apply to everyone else no longer apply to those people in his circle. And that wasn't just the civil servants and others, but even the way Sue Gray reflects how they spoke to the staff who worked in, in that building, who were also working through the pandemic and were disrespected on a routine basis, I think just speaks to that level of entitlement and disrespect for everyone and everything. You know, we said goodbye to people during the pandemic in my department. We did it with cards and emails or phone calls. It is quite possible to wish a colleague all the best without having to wrap, bring in a karaoke machine um, and bottles of wine um, and have people in altercations and throwing up on the floor. It is quite possible in a pandemic to say to somebody, I wish you every best and send them a card. And maybe the Prime Minister should have been slightly more thoughtful in the way he conducted himself. And I have to say, Robert, I have a lot of respect for you and we worked together in mm. your previous role and as minister. But how you could believe anything that Boris Johnson says at face value is beyond me at this point. If he told me it was raining, if he told me it was raining, I would have to put my hand out the window to check for myself. I come back in. Man in the white shirt. I agree what Boris Johnson's on is completely wrong, right? My difficulty, having worked in the private sector and the charity sector, where we worked every day during COVID and I brought staff in to look after the children of doctors and nurses, I won't trust any politician in Northern Ireland. In fact, if I had to hire any... Including the panel. In the including the panel. Because every one of them have told lies on some occasion. They've cheated. It's, there's an inability to say sorry in your party unless you follow your line. There's an inability to think for yourself as politicians. We have to get politicians who put their job above the colour of their party, and we haven't got that. Emma. Well, I think to go back to the question, and I actually think what we heard today, you know, about that sacrifice of so many thousands and thousands of people on the front line across the United Kingdom, you know, to keep people safe, to do a job and to do a duty, you know, it really genuinely grieves me to think that there were thousands and thousands of people who passed away with no loved one or family member or friend to hold their hand in those final moments because of those rules and regulations that are put in place to protect people and to try to stop this virus. And I think that's why people are genuinely upset when they see this type of thing. You know, I, 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 and with the last comment about integrity in public life, I do believe very, very firmly 
Lawmakers should not be lawbreakers, very, very clearly. And we've had too many examples of that. We've got the Boris Johnson situation. Here in Northern Ireland, you had Michelle O'Neill and Sinn Féin bringing 5,000 people <laughs> onto the streets. When I know people, I know people who couldn't even attend their parents' funeral because of the number of restrictions. It's not good enough. You have to lead by example, and we must all do better. Peter. The first, the first, the first and only duty of a leader is to make sure the culture of his organisation is right and that the organisation overall is delivering the outcomes that it needs to be doing so. Boris Johnson failed on that. The really important thing about what we learnt about Boris Johnson's behaviour throughout the pandemic is that he, is, he lies, he's reckless, and that he's incompetent. This has now been proven in the Sue Gray report. The, really re the, the reason why this is so important is if we now look at the way our country is run, the fact that our international reputation is being shredded, the fact that the protocol is not delivering and the negotiations aren't being sorted out. There's almost 7 million people waiting for treatment in the NHS, no more so than here in Northern Ireland. The fact that we have 56,000 people who are victims of serious crime who are waiting for their day in court. We have an economy with low growth, high tax, high interest rates. Why? Because the person running our country lies, he is reckless and he's incompetent. That's why what we see in the Sue Gray report, what we now know for fact about the behaviour and the way, the, work, the way that our leader of our country works is actually having a massive impact, not just on the culture in number 10, but the way that our country is being run and perceived as a country around the world. Our country deserves better and we will not get better until Boris Johnson is gone. Right, I'm going to take one more question. You've got about seven minutes left for a very big question, but there are quite a few of you asking this, so let's hear from Craig Lynn. Is now the time for us to consider what a future new United Ireland might look like? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think it has to be a, a yes, regardless of your political stripe. I mean, we spent 20 minutes here talking earlier on. What, yes to United Ireland? Uh, not, not, no, yes to yes, considering to what it might it. look like. We spent 20 minutes talking about um, what uh, the, the, the fallout from Brexit has been because we didn't consider what the future might look like after Brexit. So I, I would, I, I'm a soft yeah. unionist, but we need to at least think about this before we decide whether we're for it or against it. John. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I actually welcome the way in which the question mm. is worded because I don't think anybody, anybody, uh, and I talk to a lot of people and I'm, I, I'm on a lot of um, debates like this, nobody is advocating um, for a referendum, a border poll, uh, tomorrow morning or indeed you know next year because that just repeats the reckless mistakes of But that Brexit. is something you want to see in the future. Oh yes of course it is <laughs> uh, and we've been very clear on this we want to see the conversation which has already taken place the fact that you're asking the question is proof of that I think people want to know what a new Ireland looks like uh, I think people want to see that um, that conversation informed and that's why we have called on the Irish government to convene a citizens' assembly, which will do just that. Um, we have called on the British government to clarify that term in the Good Friday Agreement as to what would actually trigger um, such referendums on this island. Because no matter where you are, as you've referenced, on, on the decision, on the question, you might be for, you might be against, or you might be somewhere in between, you need to know what it is you're voting for. You need to know what it is you're, you're voting against. And I think that one thing that is clear. Well, two, actually. I think there is a border poll coming at some stage. Um, and I also think that Brexit has been a huge catalyst for what could potentially be the breakup of the Union, the United Kingdom, as we currently see it. It's okay. advanced that conversation in Scotland. Because we've and, only got and five on minutes left and I need and, to get and, the rest and of the on this island, I'll, I'll be very quick as a finish. On this island, it is about how you phrased it. It's a new Ireland. It's not about rubbing a line out of a map. It's a new Ireland okay. where all of the protections of the Good Friday Agreement are there no matter what your position and no matter whether you're British, Irish or okay. either. Emma. Well, look, I think we need to be very careful not to buy into some spin around this. In 1998, the, na the combined nationalist vote was around 40%. In 2022, the combined nationalist vote is still 40%. 
So although the leadership of Sinn Féin are trying to say that there's a momentum behind this, things haven't changed. Now, I am a committed unionist. I'm a unionist because I believe what is best for Northern Ireland is to stay within this United Kingdom. I want to see a stronger United Kingdom where everybody feels comfortable, that works for everybody, which is why we're trying to address those really, really key structural issues. Now, if the other panel members want to join me in a conversation about how we can strengthen that union, how we can work for everybody, I'm, I'm absolutely open to that. But I'm not going to enter into discussion about the demise of Northern Ireland, the, the abolishing of Northern Ireland, because I don't believe it's inevitable. I, right. I believe our future lies in the United Kingdom, okay. and that's what I'm going to be working and fighting no. for. Well, I mean, John said that Brexit was a huge catalyst for change, but it was also a huge warning about making change that isn't properly considered and thought through. And I think the last thing any of us would want is a referendum without a proper understanding of what the proposition is, how it would be funded, how it would be paid for, and what the consequences of it would be. Because with every major change, there are consequences. Emma says things haven't changed in Northern Ireland um, since the Good Friday Agreement, but they have. Because more and more people in Northern Ireland no longer define themselves simply as unionist or national. It isn't the priority for a lot of people. Now 20% of the people in the Assembly represent those of us who don't designate as unionist or nationalist. And we have a stake in this society, but our passion <coughs> is about making a better future for all of our people. United Kingdom or United Ireland, what I want to see is a united society here in Northern Ireland, a one that flourishes. Robert. I think to build on Naomi's point, it is fascinating to see the change in politics in Northern Ireland. We've got to ask ourselves whether the St Andrews Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, actually reflect now the reality of politics in Northern Ireland as we see this three-way split. So the question is a really good one. But I think from your point of view, you know, I'm, I'm not English, I'm a proud Welshman, I'm, I'm really proud to be part of the UK. So I think about these issues a lot. And I think if you're sitting as a moderate unionist, which I think is the mainstream of unionism in, in Northern Ireland, you'll be thinking about things like, will my health service work better if there's a united island? Will uh, the public services that I expect and pay for work better? Will I have opportunities? Will my kids have the right opportunities? Will I suddenly be in a different minority position vis-a-vis -vis the majority? How will that work? What will the electoral system be like? You're entitled to ask all these questions, but you know, if and when there was, if there were, was to ever to be a border poll, and I take Naomi's point about there isn't an inevitable momentum to this, I would certainly be, as a friend, as a fellow Celt, saying, stay with us, because I still believe that the values that made the UK great are worth uh, protecting and supporting. Peter. I too um, think that the way you worded the question was was really helpful. Uh, of course. Well, do you well, is it, it, no, do you agree with it or not? I agree that everybody should have the right and should be considering uh, the position of every aspect of life in the community you live but, in. But so, the and question is: Is now the time for us to consider what a future well, United Ireland might look like? Do you? Agree? Every day is the day where people consider these things. And the great thing about the Good Friday Agreement is it actually legislates to give you the, the specific right to consider these things. You know, I believe that the union is a force for good within all parts of the United Kingdom and together a force for good around the world. But unions, whether it's our union, whether it's the European Union or the United States of America, only works really when the centre really works and delivers for all parts of the United, any union. The problem we have at the moment is I do believe that the uh, Northern Ireland is suffering from neglect from this government. We've already heard that in order for Northern Ireland and parties within it to be heard and respected by the government, you've got to act in an extreme way to be noticed. Uh, we also have only one parliament or assembly in the whole of the United Kingdom whereby the ministerial code can be broken with impunity, where domestic and international law can be broken. Uh, and we see the kind of behaviour of that government uh, regularly, and that's in Westminster. So we really need to make sure, if we're going to save the union, that we make Westminster deliver for all parts of the union, particularly here in Northern Ireland, which is suffering from neglect. And Westminster becomes a magnetic place where you want to go and solve problems and do business. At the moment, it okay. looks quite repulsive, because the person and the people running government are repulsive. Right. Uh, <laughs> Lots of you have got your hands up. I'm afraid on this huge question we have run out of time, so forgive me. I won't be able to come to you. Forgive me for that. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming on this evening. Thank you to you for coming along here in Belfast. It's been great to see you and to hear what you've got to say. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Belfast, bye-bye.